What's better than one Zelda game? How about three Zelda games? On second thought, scratch that. Three's a tad too unwieldy. Why don't we meet in the middle with two games? Still a pretty sweet deal, eh? In 2001, series fans were spoiled with the simultaneous release of both The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Ages and The Legend of Zelda Oracle of Seasons on the Game Boy Color. Their backstory is fascinating. Please indulge me. In an unlikely turn of events, Capcom came to Nintendo with an audacious pitch, allow them to develop a remake of the original Legend of Zelda, and, even more unbelievably, the future of the series with a set of original titles. After some back and forth, this eventually gave birth to the Triforce trilogy of three interconnected original games, which would eventually be scaled down to the two titles we'll be discussing today. Please don't take the fact that I'm covering both games in one video to mean that these aren't distinct entries in the Zelda series. Despite the Oracle games consisting of a red and blue pairing hitting store shelves on the same day and being playable on a certain flagship handheld, this is not a Pokemon situation. If Pokemon's what you're after, I've got you covered, don't worry. Just not here. Incidentally, Gen 2 video is on the way. Ages and Seasons are certainly cut from the same cloth, but each features its own unique stories, maps, dungeons, and gameplay elements. Nevertheless, I still felt it was most logical to consolidate both games into one retrospective, because they adhere to the same basic skeletal structure and overall game design philosophy. Splitting the titles up would only lead to repetition in my talking points. You freaks who can't get enough of my voice can always just replay the video. There's no need to punish the rest of my audience. Besides, the games are intended to be experienced as one combined adventure spanning two games. So who am I to go against the developer's wishes? In Oracle of Seasons, the titular character Din has been kidnapped by the villainous General Onox. With the Oracle imprisoned, the Temple of Seasons sinks beneath the Earth, and the Seasons of Holodrum fall into chaos. It's up to Link, and, by extension, the player, to rescue Din, defeat Onox, and restore order to the land of Holodrum. Each Zelda title typically comes packed with a new gimmick, and these games are no different. By standing atop one of the special stumps strategically scattered about the map and utilizing the Magical Rod of Seasons, players are able to cycle through the four seasons and transform the map accordingly. During winter, ponds will turn to ice and large snowdrifts will open up new routes. Summer sees some of those same bodies of water drying up and the growth of climbable rock-faced vines. Special flowers bloom in spring and leaves predictably fall in autumn. The seasonal transformations are wisely doled out one by one, and their uses are taught to the player gradually. Some of these are admittedly more intuitive than others, but the extent to which the lands change from season to season is praiseworthy. Even on a purely cosmetic level, the Game Boy Color's new visual splendor is put to great use in giving each season its own mood. Navigating the environment presents no shortage of puzzling moments, but Oracle of Seasons' focus actually lies more in the action and adventure realm. We'll circle back to that thought later on. The plot of Oracle of Ages relies on similar tropes. The only differences are in the details. Rather than saving Holodrum, we're tasked with liberating the land of Labrina from the sorceress Varen. She's possessed Nehru, this game's oracle, and abused her newfound power to travel through time and sow seeds of destruction for the present age. Labrina, obviously calling to mind the word labyrinth, is aptly dubbed, as Oracle of Ages primarily tests the player's puzzle-solving abilities. This emphasis is no better illustrated than with the game's main gimmick, the Harp of Ages. The accompanying time travel abilities are reminiscent of Link to the Past's ability to switch between the dark and the light worlds. Initially, the Harp's time travel is limited to set portals throughout the land. Play the song to activate one of these portals, and use it to travel to a matching portal in the past. Thankfully, this first song, the Tune of Echoes, is merely an introduction to a much more freeform system that eventually opens up. A second song acts identically to the Link to the Past mechanic. Link is free to travel past to present from wherever the player chooses, but present to past movement remains restricted to preset portals. That is, until the final song, the Tune of Ages, gloriously lifts any limitations on time travel from either direction. Players are now free to seamlessly hop back and forth between the two ages from anywhere on the map, a much appreciated evolution of the Link to the Past system. 
At this point, the game's staggering puzzle challenges require the player to carefully chart out a path through both maps, utilizing the unique topography and characters of both ages to make progress. For example, in the lead-up to the seventh dungeon, a fishing family explains that the islands of the Zora Seas are gradually drifting westward. Progression in the main quest is dependent on the player's ability to study the differing landmass coordinates and map out a path through time to bypass the roadblocks present in each age. In Rolling Ridge, the player must return to the past to actualize the feats of a legendary hero revered by the present-day Goron, as well as work through a mini trading quest between the Goron of the past and the Goron of the present. That's not to mention the actual trading quest, which has quickly become a staple of the series. I myself gave in to the temptation to consult a guide for this Herculean challenge. I'm willing to own the shame. This incarnation is as elaborate as they come, spanning the entire game and both ages. Oracle of Ages' time travel may not be as novel a calling card as the seasonal gimmick of its counterpart, but I actually think it is one of the most successful implementations of a mirror map in the entire series. I'm not going to spend much time expounding on the basic gameplay of the Oracle games, simply because I've already done so in several videos in this retrospective series. In particular, because these games are built upon Link's Awakening's foundation, much of my thoughts on that game apply here as well. Seasons and Ages controls, visual style, and moment-to-moment -moment gameplay are all near identical to their 1993 predecessor. There's no major shakeups in the overall structure either. In Link's Awakening, the player tackles eight dungeons to acquire a set of MacGuffins before a climactic encounter. I bet you'll never guess what happens in Ages and Seasons. Admittedly, this isn't an entirely fair comparison. Many games will look similar when you break them down to these basic building blocks. I think it just stands out to me because, with the pair of Oracle games being mirror versions of each other, you already have two games that follow an identical blueprint. Sharing that exact same outline with an earlier game, that also happens to look and play extremely similarly, does take away a lot of novelty from the Oracle games. Regrettably, this lineage passed along my one major gripe from Link's Awakening. I've always appreciated how that game utilized its collection of items as natural roadblocks, to slowly open up more and more of Koalin Island, and organically guide players to each objective. It's a genius approach to level design, that works wonderfully on paper, and in many future Zelda games. But in this particular implementation, the vision is failed by the limitations of its hardware. As a Game Boy game, the player is only provided two action buttons that somehow have to handle sword and shield combat on top of jumping, running, carrying, bombing, shooting, etc. Realistically, players are always going to keep the sword equipped, which leaves one sole strained button to support every other item in the game. When the map is expressly built to require item use to get from point A to point B, a player is forced to constantly fuss about in the menu equipping and unequipping items to match each screen's requirements. None of this was improved in the jump to Game Boy Color. If anything, the Oracle games doubled down on this approach, and basic navigation is even more annoying as a result. The two Ages of Ages and the four Seasons of Seasons are frequently used for spatial overworld puzzle solving. I generally enjoy this hint of almost dungeon-like gameplay when first exploring a new area, on the other hand, whenever I'm asked to pull out the harp or rod key items to transform the map and bypass an obstacle, on top of all the other inventory management from the standard item gates, I question if it was worth the inclusion. The Gale Seeds do offer a fast travel solution, but the warp points are scarce, and even a short journey of a couple screens is likely to require you to mechanically go through the motions of solving the overworld puzzle for the umpteenth time. Put simply, the mere act of getting around in these games is a huge pain point that definitely wore on me throughout my playtime. Despite the challenges presented by button scarcity, it remains a miraculous accomplishment that a full-scale traditional adventure can be squeezed into the 2.3-inch screen of the Game Boy Color. I don't want my earlier comments to diminish the achievements of the Oracle dev team in this respect. Building off the work of others is not only permissible, it ought to be encouraged in the pursuit of a stronger game. In fact, if you think of the Oracle games as a collective unit, we're actually looking at an adventure twice the size of Link's Awakening. When you consider that both games feature two maps, Holodrum and Sabrosia for Seasons, plus Labrina, Past and Present for Ages, you could even make the case that this adventure is four times the size of Link's Awakening. 
That scope is felt most in the dungeons, with a whopping 16 total. The classic dungeons are my favorite component of the Zelda formula, so I'm in heaven here. With a count that high, it's unavoidable that these dungeons do start to blend together, despite their strong overall quality. In just a minute, I'll pick out some highlights that did manage to rise above and present a distinct memorable experience. But for now, let's just look at what the dungeons have in common. They play closest to Link's Awakening, big surprise, with a focus on a dungeon item that puzzles and challenges are built around. As a general rule, the more fun and distinct items tend to yield stronger dungeons, but not always. It's just difficult to provide a fresh dungeon experience revolving around such a tired, boring item as the Power Bracelet. Exciting items like Rock's Feather, or unique, bespoke items like the Cane of Sumaria, give the designers much more to work with. In my view, this idea of distinct dungeon items is the way to go, so I'm glad it seems to have stuck as a core part of the series. Link's Awakening's dungeons were often fantastic, but were constrained by the size of the Game Boy's display. Dungeons were comprised of rooms of identical proportions that perfectly fit the limits of the screen. I'm not saying this massively compromised the dungeon design, but you can definitely imagine how it could hamper creativity. In the Oracle games, overworld exploration retains this strict grid design, but the dungeon rooms are now opened up, with Link to the Past style screen scrolling that allows for more varied dimensions between rooms. This is objectively a huge improvement, and almost makes Link's Awakening feel quaint in comparison. Oracle's early game dungeons largely lean on single room puzzles. Old classics like block pushing puzzles are joined by new additions such as color matching or snake style puzzles. All fine and good as simple tests for small keys, but there is only so much they can do to stump an experienced player. While single room puzzles never fully disappear, they do take a backseat to grander navigation puzzles in the later dungeons. These navigation puzzles are extremely effective at challenging players' understanding of dungeon layout by blocking off the obvious paths and forcing out intentionality in route planning. Players who just mindlessly waltz from room to room with no respect for how each room connects and interacts with its neighbor will find progression impossible before long. Recurring tropes like the colored switches can be effective in this regard, but the Oracle games have some new inventions that are even better. Mine carts with forked paths and switch gates are well implemented in complicating connections between rooms. While riding the cart, you are taken directly from one room to another, without the ability to stop and interact with other points of interest in between. Forks in the track can be manipulated with switches that add even further wrinkles. And then take these little carousels that can be found in the majority of dungeons. When you first step on one, it spins 90 degrees in a specified direction, but crucially reverses the direction for the next spin. When placed at a four-point intersection, this connects two paths easily enough, but assessing the other two paths isn't so simple. Only by reversing the spin direction and then taking a roundabout route back to your original entry point can you continue into uncharted territory. I absolutely adore these things, and was pleased to see their complexity grow greater and greater as they reappeared throughout both games. I've selected what I consider to be the two best dungeons from each game to briefly highlight. I enjoyed pretty much all the dungeons on some level, but these each had some distinct quality that elevated them for me. First up we have Unicorn Cave from Seasons, which shines as a result of its incredible dungeon item. In your initial tour of the cave, Link is roadblocked by all of these blocks and balls with the letters N and S written on them. I'm a tad oblivious and didn't realize that these represented the two magnetic poles until I opened the chest containing the magnetic gloves. These are easily the best item across both Oracle games, and one of the most creative in the entire series. They are incredibly multifaceted, and each of their numerous applications is great fun. By applying a like or opposite polarity with the gloves, magnetic balls can be manipulated remotely to open paths or press buttons. The boss fight sees Link threading the needle by trying to smash a spike ball into Dig Dogger, while simultaneously avoiding pulling it into contact with himself. Even cooler are the stationary magnetic blocks. Because these can't be pushed or pulled, Link himself is instead propelled. This functions both as a hookshot alternative, and as a pseudo-reverse hookshot as well. Floating across cavernous pits through the power of magnetism never ceases to be thrilling. It even works in the side-scrolling segments, and makes me feel like I've activated a flying Superman cheat code. 
Shout out to this unique enemy type that you have to reel in like a fishing rod. I love fighting these guys. Also from Seasons, I present the Ancient Ruins. The item here is a neat upgrade to the stock boomerang that allows the player to control its arc and hit hard to reach spots. Zelda games wouldn't be the same without all the series staples like the triple B, bombs, bow, boomerang. That being said, it's always a bit of a letdown when the dungeon item is a tired relic that's appeared over and over. Smart twists on these classic items are a great way for the Oracle games to have their cake and eat it too. Honestly though, the magic boomerang doesn't even really factor into the strengths of the ancient ruins. To me, this dungeon exemplifies Oracle of Seasons' emphasis on action better than any other. Whether it's a mess of snakes suddenly falling from the ceiling, or a room of statues suddenly coming to life upon opening a trap chest, the dungeon keeps you on your toes. Faced with spike floors, collapsing ground, and crushing walls, Link assumes the role of an Indiana Jones-type action hero. As a die-hard Dark Souls fan, this dungeon gives me a Sen's Fortress vibe. Which, for those who haven't seen the light, is a very good thing, I assure you. Moving on to Oracle of Ages, we have what might be the most difficult dungeon in the entire series, Jabu Jabu's Belly. I know that might sound radically hyperbolic, but I don't think it is. This penultimate dungeon takes inspiration from Ocarina of Time's Water Temple, and pushes its ideas even further. Need I say more? While I personally think all the whining about the Water Temple is a bit overblown, I have to admit the water level puzzles are quite demanding of the player. This is taken to the extreme in Oracle of Ages, and I will once again admit I did consult a guide at one point. Much of the difficulty stems from how much trickier it is to visualize the effects of raising and lowering the water when playing from a top-down perspective, with no way to look up and down at other floors. The dungeon item is merely an enhanced version of the switch hook, which was obtained way back in Dungeon 4 but I can't pass up the opportunity to gush about this item. Like the Magnetic Gloves in Seasons, this is another remix of the traditional hookshot, but with even deeper puzzle potential. Instead of pulling items to Link or Link to items, the switch hook does just what it says. It switches the positions of Link and his target. This may not sound that different from the hookshot, but players will quickly come to discover the intricacies of this unique tool. The game never runs out of spatial tests for the player. How do you use the switch hook to get this item where it needs to be, that item where it needs to be, and Link where he needs to be, all at the same time? Yet again, I applaud the decision to breathe new life into the classic arsenal, rather than settle for the same old, same old. Zelda games have historically been guilty of not satisfactorily incorporating their main gameplay gimmick into the dungeons. For example, with the sole exception of the Spirit Temple, Ocarina of Time completely neglected to use time travel in its dungeons. It took ages for the Oracle games to take their season and time mechanics into effect with the dungeons, but there is one across both games that does so. For this reason, Mermaid's Cave is one of the most memorable dungeons, almost by default. Proceeding the dungeon, players jump back and forth between the past and present of Goron Village, running errands for the denizens, and eventually acquiring both the mermaid key in the past as well as the old mermaid key in the present. I was instantly excited at the direction this dungeon seemed to be taking. I began by exploring the dungeon in the present age, but failed to make too much meaningful progress. Reluctantly, I exited the dungeon, traveled to the past, and began exploring this distinct yet vaguely familiar variant of the same dungeon. Like this video, it's basically a two-for-one deal, you're welcome, by the way. After thoroughly combing every corner of the dungeon's past version, I kept running into this deep water that put the brakes on my progress. Yet again, I was forced to admit defeat and return to the present version in hopes that I had missed something the first time around. Right away, in the very first room, it's revealed that my actions in the past had affected the present dungeon too. A bombable wall I had opened up in past Mermaid's Cave also uncovered a new pathway in present Mermaid's Cave. This new trail led me to the mermaid suit, which, when brought back to the past, ultimately allowed me to dive in the deep water and eventually best the dungeon. It's mildly inconvenient that time travel is disabled while within the dungeon, you must actually exit in order to swap between the two variants, but this is still such a creative setup. It absolutely outdoes the spirit temple at its own game. Mighty impressive for a humble GBC title. The bosses in Oracle of Ages are some of the most experimental in the series, which unfortunately translates to them being pretty uneven. With predominantly puzzle-oriented items like the Can of Samaria, 
Boss design consequently gets more creative, and it's refreshing being challenged in ways other than spamming the sword button. Reassembling Smog's constituent parts by guiding them towards convergence is intuitive, but tricky to pull off. The problem comes with bosses like the Head Thwomp, which left me scratching my head as to how I'm meant to approach the fight. Obviously I knew that I needed to throw bombs into the opened head, but for whatever reason it failed to click that the bomb needed to enter when the red face was showing. I wasted so much time thinking I was doing damage and wondering why the thing just would not die. Even after I figured the fight out, the execution failed to be much fun either. Many other boss battles came down to guessing and checking instead of legitimate puzzle solving. When there was no clear indication on which weapon could even damage the boss, I just had to try everything. The Seed Shooter is especially guilty of this. You wouldn't expect it, but this thing is often the only method of damaging a boss. And then in other cases, it's completely ineffectual, and you feel embarrassed for having even tried. Orc of Seasons has the opposite problem of ages. The bosses play it much too safe. In fact, much of Capcom's work on their proposed Zelda 1 remake was recycled into Orc of Seasons' boss roster. Of the eight dungeon bosses in the game, six are remixed versions of Zelda 1 bosses. Aquamentis, Dodongo, Manhandla, Gliok, Digdogger, Goma, the gang's all here. Add in Mothula from Link to the Past, and we're left with only one original dungeon boss itself a fairly uninspiring fight against a Castlevania-esque Medusa head. To be fair, most of the fights are remixed in some form, but that doesn't change the fact that the familiarity of these foes fails to present much excitement. This extreme reverence for the series' legacy permeates both games. Hidemaro Fujibayashi, the game director for both titles, was an existing fan of the series but an outsider to Nintendo. When he was offered the once-in-a-lifetime chance to develop the newest games in the Zelda series, it's not hard to imagine the player-turned-director indulging in the type of fan service that would also have excited him. To be clear, this is just me hypothesizing. Another possibility might be that these callbacks were included as an overcorrection, over fears that the games wouldn't feel Zelda enough coming from the external team at Capcom. Regardless of the reason, these games often come across as the greatest hits of past titles, even beyond the series staples that each game has carried forward. I'm not criticizing the inclusion of the Zora or the Goron, for example, but instead specific homages to Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask in particular. We've got the Windmill Man playing the Song of Storms. Malin and Talon not only reappear, but our main interaction with Talon is very similar, waking him up from oversleeping. Big Goron resides on the top of the mountain and grants the Big Goron sword. Even the baffling toilet hand is recycled for a cheap laugh. Although I will admit, I did still crack up at his stink bag gift. Heck, even he who shall not be named is back. Ugh, is nothing sacred? That isn't to say that the Oracle games don't deliver their own set of memorable characters and moments. The new faces are infectiously quirky, as expected, and many are very memorable to me. Ralph is something of a friendly rival that Link frequently cooperates with throughout Oracle of Ages in his quest to rescue Nehru. This is different from the normal guide functions provided by Kapora Gabora and the like. It almost feels like a classic Pokemon rival, pretty unique for a Zelda game. The reveal that, as Queen Ambi's descendant, he risks his very existence in fighting a possessed Ambi may come out of left field, but added some interesting depth to the climax. As a Studio Ghibli enthusiast, I instantly fell in love with Maple, the clumsy witch in training. My love for Kiki's delivery service is so strong, I can even forgive what is possibly the most frustrating heart piece in series history. Both games feature a trio of animal companions with their own unique movement abilities. Dimitri the friendly Dodongo, Moosh the flying bear, and my boy, Ricky the boxing kangaroo. Link looks so cute in his pouch, and there is nothing more satisfying than winding up a screen-clearing punch. Note to all aspiring game designers, Never underestimate the appeal of kangaroo-fueled power fantasy. Link has a brief run-in with each of these colorful characters, but can only gain one as a permanent companion. Wisely, Ricky is designated as the default, and players with dubious taste must go out of their way to choose Dimitri or Moosh. At least that's the case in Oracle of Seasons. Who knows what ages was smoking when Moosh was selected as that game's default. The animal companion's movement abilities could easily have been just another item in Link's arsenal. I applaud the decision to instead craft character out of mechanics. I actually wish we got more of these guys. 
I can easily picture Ricky filling a Navi-like role, accompanying Link throughout his quests. As is, the animal companions are underutilized. Outside of their initial encounter, their movement abilities only come into play when navigating the Nuin region in Ages, and the Natsu region in Seasons. These are mechanically interesting as the geography is directly influenced by Link's animal choice. The landscape is silently tailored to their particular movement abilities for a main progression carpenter roundup, and remains so for future visits. The games often provide entertaining sequences like this to break up the dungeons. As much as I love Zelda dungeons, even I have to admit it would be exhausting tackling them all back to back. With 16 dungeons across both games, of course there isn't a unique scenario between each dungeon, sometimes we're simply asked to explore a newly accessible corner of the map opened up with the previous dungeon item. This too can provide that necessary breath of fresh air, but the more unique, character-focused chapters are much more notable. Once again, listing some highlights is in order. Early in Seasons, Link encounters a strange new creature, who, when followed, leads him to the underground land of Sabrosia. Besides the obvious appeal of a second interconnected map to gradually uncover, the Sabrosians are infectiously lovable. Our frequent returns to Sabrosia always provide fresh insights into their unique culture, but my favorite part is our date with It Girl Rosa. The date is so adorable with all the jealous dialogue from the other Sabrosians, and calls to mind our romantic walk with Marin in Link's Awakening. Rosa functions to unlock a new room in the Temple of Seasons, where Link learns the power to control Summer, but that's the boring part. It's the charming execution that really stands out. In the lead-up to Seasons' seventh dungeon, we have to rehabilitate a crew of skeletal pirates stranded in Sabrosia. This begins with recovering a missing bell in the Samasa Desert with the help of a disembodied head, and leads into a triumphant return to sea. And seasickness. Again, this whole episode serves mainly just to open up the southwest corner of the map, but distilling it down to that functional role is doing the game a huge disservice. The pirates are overflowing with personality, and there's even a touching connection between Queen Ambi and Cap'n that reaches across the two games. Speaking of ages, if you ask me, the best segment in the entire game lies on Crescent Island. Link takes to the sea on Rafton's, well, raft, and within seconds finds himself tossed about in a frightening storm before washing ashore on a mysterious island. If I were Link, I'd just stay away from water at this point. You'd think he'd have learned his lesson from Coalent. Crescent Island is home to another new race, the Toke. It's actually kind of refreshing that both the Sabrosians and the Tokay have never reappeared in future games. These mischievous lizards steal all Link's gear, and you have to figure out how to recover each item before leaving the island. Because Crescent Island is isolated from the rest of Labrina, this plays out like a microcosm of the Zelda formula, where, for each item you recover, more of the island is opened up, which in turn allows you to reach more of your stolen items, and the cycle continues. The Tokay don't pull any punches, Link is truly stripped of everything, sword included. Well, I guess he's not truly stripped of everything. The Toke had the decency to leave him his tunic at least. That might be giving them too much credit though. The Toke don't seem to have much concept of clothing, and instead think of Link as a green Toke like them. A strange Toke lacking a tail. Having all your growth essentially reset is a really interesting phenomenon, and leads to some truly creative puzzles that utilize each item's unique traits perfectly. Only once Link has recovered his shovel, sword, shield, feather, power bracelet, bombs, flippers, seed satchel, and harp can he enter the third dungeon. Contemporary gamers may recognize this chapter as a precursor to Breath of the Wild's Eventide Island, which was also directed by Fujibayashi. My final example isn't as character-focused as the others I've highlighted, but I found it really fascinating and exciting. In Oracle of Seasons, a gate prevents access to Tarm Ruins and the Sixth Dungeon. The four jewels that serve as keys to this gate are hidden throughout Holodrum. To prevent the treasure hunt from reaching Zelda 1 levels of guess and check frustration, we are given a treasure map which marks which screen each jewel is hidden on. When limited to one screen instead of the entire map, it's both fun and feasible to try every possible interaction you can think of. You've got the classic bombable wall and old man in cave, but we're also tasked with discovering an underwater cavern, and resurrecting a fossilized mall dorm on a secret island. Cool stuff. This is obviously not an exhaustive list of the mini-episodes that punctuate the main dungeon progression, 
but hopefully it's been enough to show just how varied the gameplay can be. With how safe the Oracle games play it in their core foundation, the games ran the risk of coming off as just another Zelda game. From our modern perspective, it might seem like the series was still in its infancy back in 2001, but believe it or not, the Oracle games are already the 7th and 8th entries. As a diehard fan of the series, I'm personally not one to complain about more Zelda games, regardless of how iterative they are. That being said, I'm not representative of the larger market, and the team likely felt pressure to innovate in an effort to stave off the impression that these were just generic releases. This culminated in a series of risky choices that ultimately proved hit or miss. From the opening moments of each game, it's immediately established that we're not in Hyrule anymore, which is surprising given the reverence for Zelda's legacy. Link's Awakening and Majora's Mask successfully broke from the classic setting in the past, but this is still a risky endeavor. I've settled on a middle-of-the-road verdict. The new settings of Holodrum and Labrina don't detract from the experience, but don't necessarily enhance it either. Neither setting is satisfactorily differentiated, because the team's attention was split between both games. Crafting bespoke assets for each game would be incredibly impractical, and I'm absolutely not calling for that. But with these games sharing assets with each other, as well as Link's Awakening, it's no surprise the worlds start to blend together in my mind. Obviously there's not much that can be done to differentiate Goron Mountain, Rolling Ridge, or Taltal Heights from Death Mountain. They all just act as the obligatory mountain for their respective games. Still, did we really need to slap Lost Woods in Holodrum? The new settings never really get a chance to shine when they lean this heavily on Hyrule for inspiration. New worlds come with new villains, but Onox and Varen are about as generic as you can get. I'm really having trouble coming up with anything interesting to say about them at all. The transformations each takes during their final fights are pretty cool, I guess. The dragon form Onox takes is quite impressive sprite work for the Game Boy Color. Fortunately, these villains don't have to carry the story all on their own. Which brings me to the linked game system, another innovation the development team crafted. Once a player completes one of the games, a cliffhanger teaser reveals that Twin Rova were the real villains at work, toiling behind the scenes. By entering in a special password into the sister game, the adventure will continue, and eventually culminate with Twin Rova managing to revive a mindless animalistic version of the Demon King, Ganon. I ordinarily don't care for surprise villains because they never receive the necessary buildup, but Onox and Varen are such weak antagonists, I'll gladly accept this Ganon twist. There's no opportunity to heal between the two-phase Twin Rova boss fight and then the Ganon fight. Make sure you're fully upgraded before this marathon because you're gonna need it. Yet another Ganon appearance may tempt you to dismiss this fight, but I find this botched revival of a flawed Ganon to be a fascinating new angle that leaves Twin Rova as the main antagonists. Obviously, we've faced them before in Ocarina of Time, but that was in a support role, and they've yet to wear out their welcome. There's a lot more going on with the linked game system beyond just unveiling the true ending. Numerous small changes are made to the second title that take into account the player's experience in the first. I should clarify that there is no set order to the games. If a player plays Seasons first, as I did, then Ages will act as its sequel, but it works in reverse as well. None of the changes are anything major, it's all little nods like your animal companion returning, key characters appearing in the opposite game, and various NPCs remembering your exploits in the neighboring land. Zelda herself also plays a larger role in a linked game, with a mid-game rescue sequence and then playing a part in the aforementioned Twin Rova climax. Rounding out the additions is a new Hero's Cave mini-dungeon. An extremely powerful ring rewards players willing to brave the grueling gauntlet. More on rings in just a minute. During the course of a linked game, Link will hear rumors of secrets in the world of the first title, and players are given a password to deliver to their original save file. Once this secret in the first title is unlocked, another password is given that can be used in the linked game to transfer the reward back to the current campaign, where it will be more useful. This is an effective way to keep the previous game relevant, and the cohesion between the two games is really neat where they are essentially passing the baton back and forth. As inelegant and immersion-breaking as the passwords can be, it's nevertheless exhilarating to unlock fun new toys and overpowered upgrades with this system. As long as players understand that the games can never be designed around bomb chews and other optionals, I can't imagine how anyone could take issue with their inclusion. This is the only way to fully upgrade your bomb bag, seed satchel, shield, and heart containers, not to mention acquire the legendary Master Sword. Several of these secret unlocks take the form of rare and powerful magical rings, 
So let's segue to yet another risky addition Capcom has attempted to make to the tried and true Zelda formula. As far as I can tell, the ring system was intended to offer a light customization element that gives players just a tiny bit more control over their experience. Your typical ring will offer a small buff in one area, like charging spin attacks faster, taking less damage from spikes, or dealing more damage with bombs. None of these standard rings are impactful enough to make any sort of discernible difference, but at least they do have minor gameplay implications, which is more than can be said with the broad category of novelty rings. Some of these function as a sort of proto-achievement for tasks like slaying enemies or collecting rupees, and others will change Link's sprite, good for a 5 second smirk and not much else. While Link's ring box can be upgraded to carry up to 5 rings at once, only one single ring can be equipped at a time. Honestly, with options like these, why even bother? You'd be hard pressed to notice any of the effects, and even if you could, do you really want to spend even more time in the menus swapping rings to fit each niche application? If you're anything like me, you might try and ignore the system entirely. Unfortunately, players aren't given a choice in the matter. The ring system is relentlessly shoved down their throat whether they care or not. There's nothing worse than receiving a throwaway ring as a reward when you're expecting something useful like a heart piece. This is just the tip of my complaining iceberg, because there's actually a third category of ring. A small number of extremely powerful rings are granted as rewards in the late game. The two biggest offenders among these are the red ring, which doubles Link's sword damage, and the blue ring, which halves all incoming damage. An upgraded sword or fully upgraded life total both already produce stark differences in difficulty of the final bosses, and this is only exacerbated with these two rings. The inevitable outcome is one of two issues. Either the final bosses will be total pushovers for a fully upgraded player, or they will be impenetrable walls for less upgraded players. Of course, the player who took the time to fully explore and find all the secret upgrades should expect an easier fight, but if it's too trivial, this player will feel punished rather than rewarded for their thoroughness. On the other hand, optional content should remain optional. Less motivated players should still be allowed to see the game through without seeking out every single hidden upgrade. You may not have even thought this possible, but I feel the game somehow hits both these extremes at the same time. To illustrate how anticlimactic these final bosses are when fully upgraded, let's watch back some of my footage with a focus on the damage side. The blue ring effectively doubling your life total to 32 hearts is obviously busted, but doesn't exactly present itself to exciting footage. I suspect some of you may have started to zone out by this point in the video, and the red ring is much more flashy. First of all, Twin Rova Phase 2 is completely broken. I'm dealing so much damage with a single spin attack that the boss becomes effortlessly stunlocked, and I'm never once in danger of taking a single point of damage, let alone 16 hearts of damage. Remember, the fully upgraded player is better at taking hits as well as dealing them. Then we have the Ganon fight, the ultimate boss battle that both games have been building towards. When Link is fully upgraded, Ganon gives up the ghost in 10 standard sword swipes, and the fight is unlikely to last more than a minute. I'm personally someone who enjoys collecting all the optional upgrades, so I could show you that side of the coin directly, but we'll have to talk in theoretical terms for the mainline unupgraded player experience. According to my cursory research, the Master Sword deals 2.5 times the damage of the base wooden sword, and then the Red Ring doubles that yet again. With some simple napkin math, we can deduce that the mainline player would hypothetically need to hit Ganon 5 times as much as the completionist player, for 50 total slashes. I say hypothetically because a standard sword slash isn't even an option for this player. With anything weaker than the Master Sword, Ganon can only be damaged by a spin attack. These spin attacks might deal double damage, but they are also far trickier to land, so I think demanding this player to land 25 spin attacks is actually an even wilder proposition than the 50 standard slashes. For added context, Ganon can only withstand 5 spin attacks from my Master Sword Red Ring combo. If even the 1 minute final boss fight was too long for you, the game gives you options to cut it down even further. It might sound impressive to beat Ganon without taking any damage, but when he goes down this quickly you don't even see half of his attacks. Longer fights inevitably open the door to more opportunities for mistakes, and when Ganon is dealing multiple heart pieces of damage with a single attack, 
A player with a smaller life total isn't afforded very many mistakes at all. Landing 25 spin attacks while not making more than a few mistakes of your own is quite the test of endurance. When I claim that both the completionist player and the mainline player are left with an unsatisfying fight, the obvious reaction, perhaps one you share, is that I'm focusing on the extreme outliers, and the typical player will actually end up somewhere in the middle. I admit some will of course be treated to this Goldilocks experience, but I don't believe it will be anything close to the majority. This boils down to the steep unlock conditions for these upgrades. Even the Noble Sword, an intermediate upgrade between Wooden and Master, requires players to complete the entire trading sequence, which is almost assuredly the first thing a non-completionist player would pass on. The Red Ring is a reward in Seasons for completing a laborious side quest, to find and vanquish four golden beasts that appear in the overworld. Again, this is something a typical player is very likely to skip over if they weren't aware how crucial the prize is. Additional heart pieces are certainly an impactful piece of the puzzle, but their effect on the perceived difficulty pales in comparison to the sword upgrades and colored rings. Heart pieces also exist on a gradient where the player's power level slowly increases with each one, while the ring and sword upgrades are more black and white. Either you have them or you don't. The unlock conditions are steep enough that the average player will not stumble into any of these upgrades, while the player determined to see everything will of course acquire all of them. The Oracle player base is thereby split by the very game design into the haves and the have-nots, with a large rift in the middle where only a small minority of balanced players might live. I'm frankly left baffled at how the developers could possibly allow this extreme difficulty imbalance to exist, especially when you consider how easy it would have been to correct. This whole ring system also serves to offer additional collectibles for the completionist player. Yet, as a completionist myself, I can't stand them. With 64 rings to collect, and the vast majority being essentially useless, that's a metric crap ton of busy work just for a meaningless sense of pride. It's all simply unnecessary bloat that distracts from the actual appeal of the games. To make matters worse, rings act like Pokemon in that there are version exclusives. Certain rings can only be found in Seasons, or only found in Ages, before they can be transferred over to the opposite game. To make matters even worse, some of these version exclusive rings can only be found in a linked game. That's right, to complete your ring collection you have to play both games twice. To make matters even worse still, 16 of the rings rely on RNG courtesy of the anti-fun Gasha Seed system. There's no way to guarantee a seed will yield the particular ring you are missing, so you just have to keep trying until you get lucky. It's entirely possible for a player to plant a hundred or more Gasha seeds and still not complete their collection. Furthermore, it's important to remember this isn't like a slot machine where you instantly find out what the Gasha reward is. You have to leave the seed, kill some time, or more accurately kill some enemies, before returning to learn what specific disappointment is waiting for you. Despite the escalating worsening of matters, I did still complete my ring collection, just so I could tell you how painful it was. I've 100%ed all previous Zelda games as I make my way through this retrospective series, so I wasn't about to stop now. Anything for you, the viewer. That being said, wouldn't you know it, the darndest thing happened. I was really looking forward to showing you the footage I proudly recorded of myself painstakingly collecting each and every ring but just discovered at this exact moment that it all somehow was corrupted and is thus unusable for this video. Really unfortunate that I played through each game twice and spent dozens of hours harvesting Gasha nuts, and now I can't even thrill you with the footage. You'll just have to trust me when I say that I collected all the rings, because I definitely did. No doubt about it. As I see it, the major shakeups that the Oracle games bring to the Zelda formula are the novel settings and villains, the linked game features, and the ring and encompassing Gasha system. The new settings do little to set themselves apart, and I could give or take the new villains. The idea of linked games that communicate back and forth is really forward thinking though, especially for the time, and largely works for me. The passwords are admittedly tedious to transfer back and forth, but remember this is 2001 technology we're working with here. The system gives the games their own distinct feel from other games in the series, and opens the door for a fresh style of storytelling. The linked game's role as a sequel also partially redeems the underwhelming Onox and Varen. These two were only a setup for the true villain Twin Rova. 
And then you have the ring system. The intentions may be pure, an innocent customization option to encourage players to better engage with the adventure, but the execution can only be described as an abject failure of design. Like I said earlier, these new ideas are hit or miss, and the ring system is definitely a miss. To soften the blow a bit, I will mention that, despite striking out in some respects, I do ultimately admire the team's willingness to try new things. Well, the YouTube timeline is telling me that it's time to offer some concluding thoughts. Just give me a few more minutes, okay? Jeez. As I'm sure you can tell, I have profoundly mixed feelings about these games. I have plenty of evidence to frame this video as a case where the developers played it too safe in honoring the games that came before. At times, it feels like the new team was simply following a recipe left to them by the legendary titles of the past. This is a foolproof path to a solid, if unremarkable, entry in the series. I'd play that game and probably still love it, but I don't think any of us would wish the Zelda series to grow so stale. I would never encourage designers not to take risks or think outside the box. On the other hand, in some areas I wish they did stick to what's proven to work. Innovations like the ring system ultimately did far more harm than good. There's no shame in intelligent iteration, especially at your first attempt at bat, and I suspect the more radical ideas were implemented simply because the dev team was desperate to set their games apart somehow. Change for change's sake is an equally undesirable outcome for Zelda's future. I fully acknowledge the contradictory nature of these thoughts. It's completely paradoxical to say the games both play it too safe and take too many risks, yet that's where I'm at right now. I wish I could come down definitively on one side or the other. Maybe you guys can help me make up my mind. Please don't hesitate in sounding off in the comments. I do want to make one final disclaimer, hidden here at the end so I could maintain credibility as long as possible. The truth is, Oracle of Ages and Seasons are the only Zelda games I had not played prior to beginning work on my retrospective project. With each other game, I had prior experience, often several playthroughs worth from my younger days to draw on. For whatever reason, the Oracle games were the only ones in the entire series to slip me by until now. When I played them back this past year for the purposes of this video, it was my first playthrough, and it would be dishonest to pretend that couldn't have colored my perception. In particular, I suspect the sameness angle may have struck me especially strongly, because I was drawing from a lifetime of playing every single other Zelda game, including the ones that didn't exist at the time of Ages and Seasons release. That being said, I do my best to keep this in mind with my critiques. I always endeavor to judge games primarily with respect to the time and place they were released into, with slight considerations for how well they hold up today. However, that doesn't erase the fact that I may have had a totally different relationship with these games, had I played them as a kid, as with all the other Zelda games. Of course, during my four playthroughs and days on end grinding Gasha nuts, I did form a special connection with the games. As a loyal viewer who made it to the end of the video, surely you trust me on that, right? In fact, those four playthroughs so thoroughly tarnished the number four for me, that I think we'll just skip right over Four Swords with this series. Pokemon Gen 2 will be my next video, but when I return to Zelda, it'll be with Wind Waker. Way back in 2020, in a shoddy Zelda 1 retrospective that was viewed by friends and family exclusively, past Austin made the call that the multiplayer games didn't belong in the mainline series. And now present day Austin, lucky him, has to endure the abusive comments that are surely on their way, as the Four Sword fan club gears up for battle. Sorry guys, but that's just the way it is. Anyway, Pokemon first, but Wind Waker will follow eventually. I hope you're looking forward to both. Of course, this is all possible thanks to your support, so I can't thank you enough. I'm really excited to hear your thoughts on this video and the games in question. Get typing already! I truly appreciate each and every one of you for simply watching my videos, but I'd be remiss not to give a special shout out to my main squad on Patreon. Axel Deeker, Sarah Marguerite, and Andreas Schouten. And that's all the time I've got. It's time to say goodbye. Thanks again, and until next time, take care.